Well, good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. We're going to con- we're going to continue and pick up our walk through the book of Acts. We're going to be covering uh, chapter 5 verses 12 through the end of the chapter today. In 1961, Ada as a 19-year-old came to Christ in the Soviet Union. She immediately had this impulse to share it with others, so much so that she ran to the store and purchased some postcards, and on the back, she began to write a poem, her own poem that was titled, Happy New Year 1962. It began just talking about the ebb and flow of life, how it's filled with grief and sadness and sometimes a happy-go-lucky spirit. But then halfway through, it asked the question, how will you give an answer to your creator? And then it concluded with these words, seek God while he may be found. She then took those postcards with her poem on the back, and she, she stood uh, in, in the busiest city there in, uh, in Lingard, uh, what, is, uh, <coughs> uh, what is equivalent to Fifth Avenue in New York City, and she would pass out her cards to every passerby. Now, she was, of course, arrested in April of 1962, and she was tried in a communist court She would be exiled from her city, lose her job as a lab assistant. She was arrested again shortly thereafter, sent to labor camp for a year, and then two years later would be arrested for a third time, this time sent to a labor camp for three more years. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus tells us that you are the light of the world, And a city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but puts it on a lampstand, for it it must give light to all those who are in the house. Then he says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Beloved, what we're going to see this day as we walk through Acts chapter 5 is that the apostles had to be a light. They had to be a witness. They would constantly go back to the temple and to shine that light and to preach the name of Jesus Christ no matter the cost. And truth be told, this passage is going to be I mean, challenging. It, it is picturesque. It is, it is uh, one of those passages that you and I read on, as we read our Bibles, and, and we, are, we are challenged by the freedom and the victory that the apostles showed, that they did not love their lives even when faced with death. Will you pray with me this morning? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, God, we cannot believe that you are a God who who inhabits the praises of your people, that you have made us a living temple to know you and to walk with you, to be able to gather together, to be able to pray together right now in Jesus' name, and to know that you meet with us as your sons and daughters, that you call us your own. And so right now, in Jesus' name, we pray for your spirit to convict us where we fall short of being a witness for you. But at the same time, Father, to lift our heads because you are the only one that can empower us, that can give us courage, that can give us boldness to walk out in newness and victory of life. So we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we've hit on this for a couple weeks, but I need to continue, all right, because you need to see this, and that is that Luke has this repeated theme all surrounding the temple, okay? We're going to climax on that today. It's all surrounding the temple. Now, he has two summary statements 
In, in chapter two, verse 46, listen to what he says. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. That's a summary of what was happening with the early church. And then again, at the end of our section here today, he repeats almost an exact similar statement. In chapter five, verse 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And sandwiched in there, we have all of the movement that happens surrounding the temple, okay? Focus your mind. All of this is surrounding of, of what happens in the temple. Remember, Peter and John were walking into the temple, but outside was a lame beggar who had been there, a 40-year-old beggar who, who uh, was lame from birth. And he is outside the temple, understandably, because he is socially ostracized. He was not allowed inside the temple. But as Peter and John come up to them, in Jesus' name, he gets healed right there on the spot. Okay, and he then crosses over with them into the temple courtyard. Now, there's an incredible statement that reminds us of Isaiah 35, verse 6, where, where in Isaiah 35, it says, when God shows up, when God draws near, uh, undoubtedly talking about the Messiah, it says, then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. And then an ax Three, verse eight, what does it say? And with a leap, he stood upright and he began to walk and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And then all day, Peter and John, they stand right there in the temple courtyard as, as hundreds and thousands come to, come to him and surround and they preach and proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and, and thousands come to faith. Well, it's, not, it's at the end of that day that the temple guards and the leaders, they show up, right? And they are opposed to this movement of God. They say, in what name have you done this? Now, you got to understand that the temple, the name of God is very important, right? The name of Yahweh. Four times when Solomon is dedicating the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, it says, in the name of Yahweh is this temple, right? Yahweh's name is on this. He will move for the power of his name. And, and, and the, the Jewish leaders at the time, you see, they think they are defending Yahweh, but the fact of the matter is, is they are fighting against him and against his very own son. And so Peter stands up and proclaims, in the name of Jesus, this undeniable miracle has occurred. So what do they do? They threaten them. They say, do not keep speaking in the name of Jesus. But after they're released, they go back to the core group of disciples. They're afraid, right? Because there are threats that are being made upon them, and they are afraid. So what do they do? They read God's word. They pray together. And the Holy Spirit refills them, right? The new living temple, wherever we meet. Okay, the Spirit filled them. They're filled with courage and boldness and unity and generosity, and you just see this incredible picture that unfolds. And then last week where we were, right, you, you saw that, that the new living temple, similar to uh, the dedication of the tabernacle when, when Aaron and his sons offered the strange fire and were struck dead on the spot, that, that in the new living temple, when, when, when people come with irreverent hearts, God struck Ananias and Sapphira dead on the spot. That's, that's why we've been taken back this day, right? About, hey, let us worship God rightly. And so now, the reason, guys, we keep highlighting the new temple versus the old, because that's exactly the emphasis of the text that we've been walking through. Because God thinks it's so important to display to the old that Jesus is the fulfillment of the temple, of sacrifices, of the priesthood, and that his spirit now resides in his people. It is why Jesus commanded his disciples, you must go back to Jerusalem. 
You must go because you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you need to stand in the temple and proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. You must go back and do it right there. You must be a light shining in that very spot. You have to announce it. And so every day, this is where the apostles are meeting in the temple courtyard. And so as our text opens in chapter 5, verse 12, we find the apostles back at Solomon's portico. Look at verse 12. And at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. And they were were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. Boldness to go right back to the very spot that they were previously arrested. And God continues to give signs and wonders at the hands of the apostles. And is it any wonder that verse 13 tells us that the apostles were held in high esteem, but but many people kept their distance because, well, Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead. So they're really high esteem, but let's keep them over there just a little bit. In verse 14, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of Men and women were constantly added to their number. Think about this with me for a moment. The last number that we were given after the healing of the lame beggar and they preached the gospel in the temple courtyard all day, last number we were given was 5,000 men, that that the numbers had grown to 5,000 men. So if you extrapolate and say, well, well, then maybe there were 5,000 women and 5,000 children, or we're up to like 15,000 people. That was the last number that we were given. And here, it says that they were meeting daily in the temple and that God was continuing to give favor, okay, and and adding to their number day by day. We might be up to 20,000 people. Guys, that's a third of the population of Jerusalem. Think about that, one in three. And then the next verse tells us that that they were coming from outside, the surrounding cities, outside Jerusalem. There was so much that was happening around the temple. They were coming in because they had heard. They They came for prayer and for healing, all in Jesus' name. The early church is exploding in months. It's magnificent. Verse 17. But the high priest rose up. As you go through this account, the the, the focus is going to be on the high priest. He's going to take a prominent, authoritative role. The high priest rose up along with all of his associates. That is the sect of the Sadducees. We covered them a couple weeks ago. And they were filled with jealousy. And they laid hands on the apostles and put them in public jail. You see, there's a power struggle that is suddenly on their hands. And the high priest will not sit idly by, right? He says the crowd should be, should be uh, gathered around us, not them. A public jail here means a visible Jail. They are visible to the public. All jails were public jails. This is a visible jail. You see, out of jealousy, the high priest attempts to shame them publicly, label them as troublemakers. This sort of thing had worked well in the past in order to shame criminals. Only this time, you see, he didn't take into account the hand of God Almighty. Because look at verse 19. That night, an angel of the Lord freed them from behind locked doors and multiple guards. Freed them, all 12 apostles. And nothing was undisturbed. There was no natural explanation. Now put yourself in the apostles' shoes because you, you have just had a jailbreak in the middle of the night. All right? What are you going to do next? They don't flee. They don't run for safety. Instead, they go right back to the temple. Listen to the angel in verse 20. 
Go, stand, and speak to the people in the temple this whole message of this life. Guys, do you think this is important to God? Okay, to send an angel to free them, to say, hey, you go be light right back in the temple. The people have to hear. They must hear, and you must stand right there to preach this message of life. Do you remember Jesus' triumphal entry? And as he was coming in, the, uh, uh, the crowd began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the leaders said, shut them up. They cannot be saying that. And Jesus' reply was, friend, rocks will cry if they don't, because it must be declared. And so right here, within the early church, an angel gets the apostles miraculously out of jail. Again, guards locked behind closed doors, all of that stuff gets them out and says, you must go right back to the temple and you must keep proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. It's magnificent. So I want you to think about how important this is, not only for salvation history, right? Not only for the declaration that the new has come to replace the old, but I also want you to think about the compassion of God. The compassion of God so that the people would hear and be called to life. Well, the Sanhedrin is called together the next morning only to hear a report, right, that the doors are still locked, the guards are all in their place, but all 12 apostles are gone. They vanished. There's absolutely no logical explanation. Now, as they're pondering this, okay, they're probably imagining they're long gone. In comes a report. They've been standing all morning in the temple, again, proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ to another large crowd. So the 12 apostles get rearrested. And you have to understand the situation is delicate. Luke tells us the situation is delicate because because the crowd is so for the apostles. They are hearing the name of Jesus and so much is happening that that they have to arrest them but be very kind in front of the crowd, right? They're, They're treated. This whole thing is volatile to the Jewish leaders. Now look at verse 28. Look at the questioning of the high priest because he says, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and and intend to, to put his blood upon us. Now, what do you notice that's unique about the high priest's wording here? He won't say Jesus' name. He avoids it. Well, why do you keep teaching in this name? And secondly, you see, the public tide has changed so much that they now begin to fear the imputed blame. And why are you putting this man's blood upon us? You see, it's a softened stance, a kink in their armor. They can't sleep at night because they continue to ponder all that's taking place. They're saying something like this. Hey, can't we all agree that that some mistakes have been made here? And and look, who's pointing fingers at one another? Just, Just stop blaming us for his blood. All right, here we go. 
Okay, because this is the moment, right? When, when the apostles are going to respond, Peter is going to take the lead. And Luke records a short summary for us, but, but I'm going to give you the passionate, expanded sermon version, okay? Peter says, his name is Jesus. The name you won't say, his name is Jesus. And I was there that night. I stood there that night when when that Jesus was at your house in your courtyard. And you spit in his face. And you tore your robes and you said blasphemy. He claims to be the son of God, the Messiah. And you thought that you won by nailing him to a cross. Because then he would become a curse of God. And you convinced the whole crowd that there's no way the Messiah could be killed like that. And you yelled, may his blood be on our head and may his blood be on our children's head. But God raised him from the dead. And we cannot and we will not stop being witnesses to the name of Jesus. And by the way, God exalted him to his right hand, just like Jesus told you he would. And everything that you keep seeing is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit proving that he is at the right hand of God the Father and that he is the Prince of Heaven and that he is Savior and that his becoming a curse was paying the punishment for our sins that in his name is the only way that any of us can find forgiveness and be made right with God. It's no longer in you, Mr. High Priest, because Jesus has come, and he is the new high priest, and he is the new temple, and he is the final sacrifice. Don't you remember when the veil was torn in the temple at his death? Did that not shake you? Did you not see it as an omen from God? He told you he would destroy this temple and raise it up in three days. It's why we proclaim his name. It's why we stand in the temple courtyard day after day. Because the temple points to him. And it was in the name of Jesus that a lame man that you have walked by for days decades was healed right before your very eyes and why last night an angel of the Lord broke us out of prison and told us get right back to the temple and keep proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ and all of this is evidence that the Holy Spirit of God is moving and that you are fighting against God Is it any wonder in verse 33, it says, but when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. Peter's response was polarizing. There's no middle ground. Right? The apostles prayed for boldness. And when the moment came, they did not shrink back. But get this, when you read the text, you know what it tells us? That the Holy Spirit of God opened the eyes of the Sanhedrin. He convicted their hearts that there is this moment right here where they are cut to the heart and they can respond in one of two ways. They can repent and find life or they can get angry 
to the point where they intend to kill all 12 of them right then and there. And that was their intention. Verse 34 says, but a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, he stood up in the council. He said, hey, put those guys aside. Let me talk to you. And then he unfolded a quick history lesson for them. This is verses 34 through 38. And he looks at him and he says, hey, listen, don't, don't you remember uh, Theudas and Judas of Galilee? All right, th those crazy guys, they, they rose up. They had a following of hundreds. But, but what happened after they died? What happened to that following? It disappeared. It scattered. Nothing came of it. You see, charismatic leaders rise up all the time, but as soon as that guy dies, the following fizzles. So verse 38, he says, So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men. Let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. Now, clearly, this is his emphasis, right? He is not a believer. He's a well-distinguished, uh, reserved man. He has a lot of wisdom, but he is not a believer. And his whole point of this is to dismiss Jesus as a fraud. He says, leave it alone. It will dissolve. Okay? If history has anything to say, right, it will dissolve. But what he is about to say is a historically resounding truth of God. Look at verse 39. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may, be even, you may even be found fighting against God. All right, this is too good. We gotta pause here. We gotta sink into this because this is magnificent. This is one of the strongest pieces of historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ right here. Let me say it to you like this. Jesus was an ordinary nobody. Born into a peasant family from a small remote village. He wasn't born in a palace and he, he wasn't born to a renowned teacher and any, anybody who influential. He was the son of a carpenter. He wasn't handsome, he wasn't tall, he wasn't rich. He was ordinarily humble. Why do you know his name? I mean, there wasn't social media, there wasn't TV, there wasn't radio. Why is it that thousands of years of history have preserved his name? Jesus was categorically rejected. He was hated by those in authority, constantly labeled as a liar and a fake. His reputation constantly under attack. He died a criminal, most shameful death, and his followers embraced it to their own shame and mocking. How does it make sense to worship a man who was rejected by his own. And how is it that thousands of fiercely monotheistic Jews suddenly worship a crucified Messiah and call him God? are so passionate about being a witness for him that they will lay down their lives for his name. And within months, Christianity explodes and will spread throughout the Roman Empire. And 2,000 years later, missiologists are predicting that within our generation, every tribe, tongue, and nation will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in their own heart language. Now, how does any of this make sense? Because as Gamaliel argued right here, this fraud will disappear. How does that make any sense? Because he rose from the dead. 
because he rose from the dead and he appeared to more than 500, proving that he is the Son of God, proving that his death was according to the plan of God for our sins. And he ascended to the right hand of God the Father and he sits there enthroned right now and he sends his Holy Spirit spirit that is attached to the message and that Holy Spirit and that gospel message is still changing lives 2,000 years later. Such that when I was 15, I was changed by the good news of Jesus Christ. And this room is filled with those who have testimony. Julia gave testimony this morning about the good news of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit changing her. That there is life in his name. And his name will go to the ends of the earth. And it cannot be stopped because it is the will of God. Will you say religion everywhere has radical people that are willing to die for their religion as well? Listen carefully to me. Christianity alone is based upon one man. Every other world religion is based upon a set of ideas about God. It is not dependent upon the messenger. Christianity alone squarely rests on the shoulders of one, Jesus Christ. Upon his virgin birth, upon his perfect life, upon his dying for our sins, upon his resurrection of proof that God has grace towards me, a sinner. And so I ask you this morning, friend, have you been fighting against God in your own life? Because there is no neutral position here. You see, the Sanhedrin tried to take a step back and take a neutral position. Friend, our culture wants to circle up and and try and make some sort of harmony, some sort of neutral position. But that is not, not biblical theology. Either he is king or you are opposed to him. He cannot be a nice teacher. If he has risen from the dead, then he is savior and he is king and he is worthy of all of your worship and of your utmost obedience to him. And if that is the truth, friend, he is calling you to life. He is calling you to life in the same way that we would say God orchestrated For the apostles that they must stand in the temple and proclaim this good news of Jesus Christ. So to you that your life has been orchestrated to be able to be here this day and to hear the gospel call. Would you come? Do you know that you have life in Jesus Christ? Friend, we meet this day to celebrate the resurrection from the dead. That's why we're here. That's why we meet on this Lord's day. Because we believe he rose from the dead. And we believe he will rise us from the dead. Amen. So look at verse 40 through 42. They took his advice, that's Gamaliel's, and after calling the apostles in... They flogged them, ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then released them so that they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. You see, they are publicly beaten in the temple courtyard so that all will see their shame. 39 lashes. 
Their backs would have to be stitched shut in order to heal properly. Their wives would have to treat their wounds nightly to ward off infection. It would be weeks before their backs would not be sensitive to the touch, ultimately leaving profuse scarring. But the apostles who touched Jesus' scars felt it an honor that the God who had delivered them by an angel now considered them worthy to suffer shame for his name. Isn't that an incredible account? Beloved, does that not stir up your faith? I mean, we look at this snapshot, we look at this picture, and there are so many applications, right? Look at the kingdom priority. Look at the value that they, they, they just wanted to be on Jesus' team. They valued it so much. Look at the freedom that they have. The freedom. I read this a few weeks ago, and I, it fits so well here. I need to read it to you again. This is a little expert, excerpt out of uh, uh, Nick Ripkin's book, Insanity of God, because he, he's talking to uh, house church leaders in China as they are persecuted. But as I read, I want you to hear this phrase that they continue to say. It says that when, when house church leaders... Uh, uh, they had this scenario of police coming in and telling them that they must stop meeting, all right? And if you do not stop meeting, we will confiscate your house and throw you on the streets. And they would reply, well, well, you need to talk to Jesus because he owns this property. Well, we can't get to Jesus, but we can get to you. And you and your family will have nowhere to live. And then their reply was, well, then we will be free to trust Jesus for shelter and for daily bread. Well, if you keep this up, we will beat you. Well, then we will be free to trust Jesus for healing. Well, then we will throw you into prison. Well, then we will be free to preach the good news of Jesus to those who are captive in prison. And we will be free to plant churches while we are in prison. Well, if you do that, we will kill you. Well, then we will be free to go to heaven and to be with Jesus forever. Verse 42, and every day in the temple. Isn't that ridiculous? They will not stop. They cannot stop. Because God said, I will have a light. And they are overwhelmingly conquerors. Because light casts out darkness. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Certainly none of us has endured, nor will we likely endure this sort of persecution. But guys, we have the same light. And we face the winds of repression that seek to dim or to blow out our light. I cannot read this account and not be challenged. Not ask, am I quenching the Holy Spirit? Am I quenching my light for fear of others? Am I a witness? I want the freedom and the victory and the life on display here, don't you? Don't you want to be called worthy to suffer shame for his name? Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of life, Father, we ask for continued courage and boldness that as we read your word, that we would not take any of the freedoms that we have lightly, that we would see the priority of being a witness for Jesus' name. 
and that we would be compelled by it. Wherever we go, in our workplace, in our neighborhood, in our family, God, help us to shine your light and to find purpose in it. God, we do confess to you our fear. We confess how often we shrink back. But God, we read your account about how you filled your servants with boldness. And we want that. We want that boldness. Father, if there's anyone here underneath the sound of my voice that has never placed their faith in you, I pray that right now in Jesus' name, Father, that they would come, that they would come to life. It's in his name we pray, amen. Beloved, as our praise team comes to lead us in one final song, you are invited to respond. I can never tell you what that looks like, but I can encourage you, I can implore you that whatever you've heard the Spirit of God say to you this morning, you must respond with obedience. Right? You must. You can do that in your seat. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. Do not let this day go by. There's a card in the pew rack in front of you. If you need to write out a prayer, if you need to say, hey, I need to talk to someone, respond to the Lord with obedience. Would you stand?